in the laws of nature there is nothing impossible except that the state of your mind makes it so. Ah, it's marvellous, they're intelligent enough to recognise that every so often I come up with some interesting, intelligent statements. Maybe if they would so daft, they would see all of it as interesting information. Cleaning up this planet is going to be a big job. If we're going to get the climate back to what we want, a lot of work got to be done. But one thing is certain, you need energy. That's important. Without John, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be the man I am today. John changed my entire life. I turned it around completely. The man is the most honest, sincere uh, friend that you could ever hope to have. He has tremendous stamina and has a, uh, almost an unheard of ability to go without sleep. Uh, he operates on uh, between, I think, three and four hours uh, max. For 40 years, I have been searching to find the clue to the cell effect. But what it did for my mind, it stimulated, it motivated it, and turned my whole life upside down. I've met Professor Searle and his associates. Uh, they're nice people. Clearly, they believe in the SEG and the, the effects that they're talking about. Basically, the design is a, a conventional generator. So, according to so, tapped into zero point energy without knowing how he did it. Here we had something we couldn't understand. It wasn't doing what I wanted. That's what the generator I wanted. The only person that I know of who has ever succeeded in making a serial effect generator, which it was named by someone else, uh, given that name by someone else. But the only person I ever know who ever made one is John Cyril. The, the problem is uh, the people, they want to, uh, to see the disc fly. I think uh, 69 to 71. The German TV uh, sent a, a report in color and there was shown a, a flyable disc. It was hovering in the, the top of the trees, I think 25 meters. The electron flow is accelerated to an extremely high rate and it creates a vacuum around the device. And in that vacuum, you develop numbing cold. And numbing cold, as we know today, is a function of superconductivity. It also, which is, has not been known, a function of gravitational force. This thing wanted to fly. For over 60 years, John Searle has tried to give to the world a new kind of energy system, one that would free mankind from the burdens of oil and fossil fuels. From his dreams as a child in pre-World War II England came an understanding of mathematics and magnetic forces that would change his life. From a childhood game of hopscotch came a new understanding of magic squares a mathematical principle that is 5,000 years old. John Searle is deaf. His deafness is the result of beatings and neglect suffered as a child. But the isolation would serve his purpose. Perhaps this physical limitation accounts for his freedom of thinking. He could think laterally and not be bound by conventional rules taught through conventional methods that may have an adverse effect on the human mind. In his quiet universe, his experience would have a different effect, an unusual effect, a natural effect, the Searle effect. On his own, and without any real formal education, John Searle is possessed by an insatiable curiosity that would lead him to conclude that nothing is impossible except that which the state of your mind makes it so.
John Searle is known all over the world as the inventor of the Searle Effect Generator, a magnetic device consisting of one or more rings, also called plates, and a number of cylindrical rollers that, when in motion, generate electricity. The generator is a magnetic device that is uh, totally magnetic. It is its own prime mover. It will self-start and continue to run, and as far as we know, we can say never stop. The Searle effect is an effect based on magnetic fields that generate the continual motion of magnetized rollers around magnetized rings, producing electric energy. The generator runs in harmony with nature. The law of the squares is harmony with nature. But the Searle effect is a great deal more than a simple generator. In our polluted and energy-starved world, it is the hope of all mankind that we find the solutions that lead us to both prosperity and harmony with nature. Is it possible to maintain mankind's industrial output and at the same time reduce the pollutants that are slowly killing planet Earth? Is there a way to increase the productivity of the human species as we rid ourselves of the poisons and recover the waters of this world? If we could get the climate back to what we want, a lot of work could be done. One thing is certain, you need energy. That's important, and it must be cheap as possible. Preferable, no pollution. No noise, no heat, no vibration, no pollution. The Searle Effect Generator. The perfect machine? As you build this, it, when you find out that it runs without friction, it runs without a governor, it runs will accept a, any load and meet it, it will dive down in temperature at one point if you build it cor correctly and actually levitate and actually lift off the Earth, developing its own gravitational field. When you see all these things and you realize that this is a perfect machine, it is an entity. It's the closest thing to a living thing that you can, man can make. Does John Searle have the answer? Is John Searle's invention the point of impact between the question, what if there is a machine that could save mankind, and the answer, the Searle Effect Generator? People say, well, you can't do this. You're going to upset the entire world economy. Uh, what, you know... The whole economy is based on oil. We have, uh, and it works, they're saying. Well, it works very well for the people who are running the economy, uh, but not necessarily for everyone else. I still uh, maintain that it will not ruin the economy. It will be a very a strong paradigm shift, much the same as the shift from horse and buggy to automobile. Surely this point of impact would produce energy of its own, human energy emotional energy, joy, relief, hope, wonder, or perhaps the darker side of human emotions, greed, hate, and jealousy. All these years I've learned one thing, you can't trust anyone with this technology, they want to steal it. And any worker seeing this and find out how it works could sell it to another company for millions. Because this too is the Searle effect. John Roy Robert Searle was born at the Downs, a workhouse, a place of disgrace in Wantage, England, on May 2nd, 1932. Ironically, that same year, Werner Heisenberg of Germany was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for the creation of quantum mechanics. Put simply, quantum mechanics is the study of the relationship between energy and matter. In particular, the relationship between electrons and photons the area in which the actual Searle effect takes place. It's photons. That's the role of, of grounding their energy to the coil. It is simply throwing photons out. That is what you see trapped in the magnetic field around it. John's father, Robert Henry Searle, and mother, Violet Gertrude Maud Pierce, would have two more children. John's sister, Iris, would arrive in 1934, and his brother, Peter, came some time after. Robert claimed that Peter was not his child, and one evening, he just never came home. Violet was abandoned, and soon after would be sentenced to jail for neglecting the children. A warrant was issued for Robert, but he was never found. As a child, it appears from all uh, official records, I was ill-treated, 
and bashed about and in the end the courts uh, placed me in the care of Dr. Minardo Holmes in England who then put me out to foster parents. John would lose contact with his brother and sister. He would be placed in foster homes, the first one at the Chestnuts, Suffolk County, England. Here he would be the responsibility of two women. There wasn't any man at the Chestnut. The school did not have no male teachers. So there's no male to force me into believing anything or do anything. Later in life, John would insist that being raised by women would be one of the most beneficial aspects of an otherwise difficult and, at times, brutal childhood. Now, I never knew the ABC. I couldn't do sums, I couldn't do anything, basically. Nobody cared about me. What I didn't know was, I have no hearing. So they were wasting their time talking to me. So they beat me. But if that would help, that made no difference. The 1930s were a time of great depression and great breakthroughs. Albert Einstein's contribution E equals MC squared made way for huge strides in science. Very soon, abstract mathematical proofs would replace ether theory as the best explanation of all things and their relativity. Others, like Nikolai Tesla, would cling to the idea that energy was all around us and that we could access this energy and transport it through the atmosphere without the need for meters or utility companies. Relativity would win the day, and ether theory would become a relic of the past. It would soon be known as archaic physics. While the greatest minds of the 20th century uncovered theories about how the universe works, far beneath this lofty exchange, four-year-old John Searle was dreaming. His dreams were specific and repeated two dreams that would alternate four times a year over the next six years. I had dreams, and those dreams are the key to all the work which I do. In fact, they're the key to all my knowledge. The dreams were actually recurring nightmares that frightened John as a boy. He would remember them, but not understand their meaning until the right time. You wake up screaming. My mother said, that's the devil. That's my foster mother. Should she give me a good belt in the belt, the devil out of me. He finished his schooling at Thorndon Infant in 1942. He then entered I Secondary School in Suffolk County, England. John would leave Suffolk County in 1944. He was transferred to Russell Coates Naval School in Dorset. There he trained to take his part in the war effort. By 1946, the war was over. John left Naval School. He got his first job at British Rewinds Electrical Repairs and boarded at number 30 Crawley Road in London. That was the first job I was given by the Dr. Menard Holmes. Uh, they placed me there for, as apprentice for electrical uh, engineering. This would be the turning point in the life of John Searle. The Searle effect is developed from the law of the squares. And it is from these squares that John Searle developed his generator and flying discs. But it didn't stop there. Over the course of his lifetime, John Searle's understanding of the squares would be used by him to explain all aspects of life in the universe. From DNA to relativity, from single-celled life to the human being, from transportation to construction of buildings, the squares could be used to understand everything. When I took up my training as an apprentice electrical engineer. But the third day, I presented a docket to take to the stores, and I saw this tube with a small tube buff. I asked the foreman what that meant. He said, that's two square. So I said, well, what is two squares? So he draws two by two, show me four squares, four. And I said to him, it doesn't make sense to me. What on earth do we have empty squares for? If it's a square, there must be some value there. You can take a square, if you run the numbers in normal, one, two, three, four, five, six, that is uniform in. But when you token them up, each row, each column, each diagonal, you'll find they add up different. Putting numbers in random 
we come up with a uniform output. Every line, every column, the two diagonals come up precisely the same. Random numbers in squares will produce a uniform total. John Searle would soon call this the law of the squares, nature's way of achieving order from chaos. This led to Searle's revelation and gave meaning to his recurring nightmare. At the age of 14, I looked at my dream. It's a game you all probably know. We call it hopscotch. The first dream, as I call it, is going to school. On my way to school, a one and a half mile walk, I would pick up all the children, and just before we get to the school gate, we have what we call a hopscotch patch on the road itself. And it consists of three squares, four, five, then the odd one, six, then seven and eight. Now, it's always that type of pattern, and there's a reason for it. I obviously been playing with all the children. It's now my turn. I've reached the point where I throw the pebble in square three. I have hopped to square two. My left leg is firmly on the ground. The right leg is now up in the air, about to move across. Square three, where the pebble is, into square four. Suddenly, all the children vanish. In the picture now comes an entirely different ingredient of a steamroller. The village steamroller, the only mobile object I've seen outside a horse and cart. This time it's coming at me from the top of the squares towards me and it's many times bigger. We have the roller done in two massive sections. And it's coming to me and it's saying, stop, think, act. If not, you had it. It's telling me by my leg movement that it's not square three I need. Go to square four. It's square four that you've got to calculate out the ingredients. Here is the story of how to do it mathematically. And of course the dream was telling me everything I wanted to know. But I had to find those answers. I had to relate what the dream was saying to what I was trying to do. So it was a slow, tedious job. And of course I got the sums wrong on a number of occasions on, on the start. From those numbers, John Searle had the exact amount of each ingredient in the rollers and rings of his generator. Now, every one square represent a quantity of a material. And that's very important. This is precisely how I developed the SEG. So I copy nature in every way. I work at trying to think how nature's doing it and then produce this object. The first recurring nightmare had become a dream with meaning. Searle's revelation continued with his second recurring nightmare. This time it relates to what I'm doing on the way back from school. Here, my job in the evening, after I changed my clothes and had a meal, I have to put the ladder up to the loft, the shed, open the door, get the straw, go and bed the hens down for the night. Now, when I get up this ladder, which is many times longer than normal, the door opens, and now, instead of bales of straw, straw stems are laid out as struts of a structure. I am now standing towards the middle part of all this structure. Then suddenly the rim is blazing away a far so massive that no one could put it out and it's all around me. But something says, have no fear. You'll be lifted out from the center of that flame. John would interpret the second dream to mean that the device would be circular and have many struts moving out from the center to the rim. Climbing the long ladder meant understanding the infinite combinations of numbers in squares. Then he would break through the trap door and be at the center of the ring made of straw. The fire meant that there would be great energy at the rim of the device. World War II had ended, brought about by the most devastating weapons ever conceived. 
the product of those lofty minds who 20 years earlier wondered what would happen if you hit a single atom hard enough. What kind of energy was stored in this tiny place? The answer, they thought, is the source of all energy in the universe. The practical answer was bang. In fact, the biggest bang mankind could ever devise. Einstein opened the door a bit further. Like most people, they come up with a wonderful formula. Einstein did. And then he stops at that and says, there's no way you can get this mass of energy out of an atom. The cost would be too high. It's not worth it. Then you see, you get another person comes along and thinks about this. Oh, no, just bump it with a proton or a neutron. His job at British Rewinds introduced John Searle to some of the vocabulary he would use the rest of his life. Words like volts, ohms, amps, and watts. The first job that really got the dream moving, and it was a simple task in Gray's End Road at the British Rewind Limited, where I was apprentice, and my job was to learn to strip motors, uh, strip the coils, measure them and count the turns and then remake a new coil and put back and they wrote it as well so i came into uh, connection with motors for the first time electric motors by 1946 john searle had a different idea how could this energy be tapped without smashing the atom into bits his idea was a completely new generator design we didn't call them solar effect generators then, but um, we were just trying to produce a generator to run the house lights on. Something simple, because I felt that the big generators at the power stations were a waste of money uh, and would present to us vast pollution problems in the future. So the whole idea was to get something simple, not difficult to produce, and produce electricity. Basically, the design is a, a conventional generator as far as how it looks. You've got a magnet passing by a coil, and all generators are, of electricity are based on magnetics and coils. You can pass a coil by a magnet or a magnet by a coil, but that gives you your deflection in the electron flow and the force in one direction. I already knew uh, most of the fundamentals, what I was doing here was trying to get rid of the petrol engine or other devices to turn the generator. That was the objective. This led to his first experiment conducted at home on a kitchen table with his landlady present. So what do you remember? Uh, I remember here we, we must have had the house here because I'm looking at the distance at the end of the road. And then it was this side all right. And I think it must be in this area. And it's gone. The first model that was built by uh, John Searle at the age of 14 and a half, uh, after receiving some inspirational dreams, uh, was assembled on a kitchen table uh, with his landlady's permission. And uh, he put it together and then started to load it as a generator. So let's put a light on it. Let's put a cooker on it, let's put an iron on it, let's see what it'll hold and how much it'll do before it bags down, heats up and burns up. Of course, that was a bad thing to do indoors. They should always do experiments outside, as I discovered. Well, as you increase the load, at, one, at a certain point, the temperature at that time mysteriously dropped down to close to 4 Kelvin, which is almost absolute zero. And when it did that, it became superconductive, developed its own gravitational field, we found later, and uh, hit the ceiling. And it was on the ceiling. And I said to the landlady, I said, that's a stupid thing. What's it doing up there? She said to me, you told me nothing would happen. And it was, it had cracked the plaster, because they plaster the ceilings. It could crack the, it hit really with force, and it was holding that. Carrying all of the wiring and the cookers and the irons behind it, dangling down. So I, stupid enough, got a ladder got on it, grabbed it. And then I couldn't let go of it. And as a result, his hands froze to the framework. So the landlady put a screwdriver in to stop it. And luckily, it didn't shatter it. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. then his, uh, he'd get his hands off of it. And that was the first experience of it levitating. 
Twice he conducted the same experiment at number 30 Crawley Road, London, England, and both times had the same startling result. Now I thought, well, the lead is heavy. Let's put some lead on the bottom. Yes. That'll keep it down. Again, I found I was wrong. I now increased the weight, I've increased the density, now there was more energy. And it went down quicker. Not only did it go quicker, floors are stress stressed downwards, never upwards. The force that sent it uh, split through the plaster timber, out through the tiles. The tiles were also stress inwards, not outwards. And it just went through like shelling a pea and out and away. Where but did it go? We don't know. Just all we know just went on and on, but not right away. When it was clear the building, it hovers. And that's where trouble number two comes in. You see, people had their sets off, radio sets off. They were off, absolute turned off. When that starts to glow, the radio sets all come on. Though then you haven't turned them on. They come on full blast. And the din it makes. And of course, I wasn't a very popular man. It eventually shot away. And I was taken to the police station and given a free home and accommodation. His new idea about tapping the energy of the atom resulted in the destruction of his home at 30 Crawley Road. It was an accident that happened, not intended or planned. Unfortunately, uh, some people didn't like it. And they chucked me into a place where I'd be secured and wouldn't blow holes through roofs and that again. What was happening to cause this simple generator design to quickly overload and lift off the kitchen table? Apparently, this was a new idea. But even the inventor could not explain what happened. It was a learning curve. I was being forced to follow. What it wanted you to know was how electric motors were done, how they were wired and that, and the relationship, now two key issues. The two key issues are electrons and magnetic fields. John Searle understood the basic principles for generating electricity. He knew electricity was made up of electrons traveling down the wires into our homes. To generate, you've got to have electrons for motion, great motion. That's why you go to the rare earth. The basic components, the primary component is a rare earth. And it can be, although it can be any of the rare earths, the component that we use is neodymium. That's element number 60 on the uh, periodic chart. And that unit puts out a, an excess of electrons for some reason, and it will also replenish them very easily. Rare earth is the greatest weight of the whole, subs, uh, whole materials that you're using. That has got to hold the mass of electrons. John Searle's idea was to find a way to ease those spare electrons out of the structure and use them. Instead of smashing the atom into bits, why not tap this vast electron reservoir by using magnetic fields, same as any generator of that time? So I say to myself, if you can release all the energy with a simple particle, surely we could ease it out gently by tunneling it, tunneling it in and giving it something to run up. So if we put a straight line, magnetic line, through and the electron spins around, all this energy is spinning around and come out, we'll get a constant flow. Tunneling into the atom using a specific magnetic field will cause the electrons to move in one direction and they can be collected and used. With production of electricity, you have two choices. You either rotate the magnetic field or you rotate the conductors. In our case, we prefer to rotate the magnetic flux. So as the roller rotates, it's also rotating around the base plate. To make his generator work, John Searle had to overcome many problems. Most of these occurred with the shape and design of his magnets and in the behavior of their magnetic fields. How can you make a round magnet orbit another round magnet without stopping or flying off? He studied the behavior of a bar magnet 
and a round magnet. There's something wrong with this. It's got a turning action on it. It was tormenting me. There was that must be able to go straight. It's the dream saying, slice the roller into eight segments. Now it will keep straight. Well, I did this, I placed it on, and it kept straight. And not only did it keep straight, it freely moved up and down. What happens if you make a ring? He knew magnetic fields could be impressed or printed on certain materials using a magnetizer, a device common to shops and factories that use magnets, such as British Rewinds. The question that baffles scientists is, why, when three was on, they just run round and round? The picture here was there was two states involved here. And of course there is. The two states referred to the two magnetic fields printed at right angles to each other. Both the roller and the plate had independent magnetic fields, one vertical and the other radial from the center to the rim. Clearly, the magnetic field was completely different to the magnetic fields we knew of. For some reason, why they were different, at the time, well, I had no idea. The intersection of these two fields produces a wave that carries the roller around the ring, although this wave was unknown at the time the phenomenon was present. So we got fields at right angles. That's why the, the whole uh, thing moves. If you haven't got two fields, it won't move. Now the two key issues for the production of electricity were present in a totally new generator design. The electrons were available in the rare earth material. The magnetic fields induced the roller to run on the plate. We didn't even know what the field looked like till a few years ago in Germany when we remade a segment. I said, well, let's have a look at this field. And we dusted it with very fine iron dust, shook off the surface. Do you know what that looked like? A bicycle wheel, exactly as it was laid out in the shed in the dream. That is the field that makes this work. Any other field won't work. That field does it. So we know that the magnetic field can be set to perform functions. Quite different to what we were taught in my day at school. Uh, and I think we, we're only scratching the surface of magnetism. Was this thing a generator? It created an extremely high voltage, but John Searle had no control over it whatsoever. With each experiment came a new set of questions. I was only looking for a generator, but it obviously was a generator that wanted to fly. So I had to put a body to it. There was no sense to just throw it away and forget it. it. Was to put a body to it, hoping that that would solve some of the problems. The unit that went through the roof at 30 Crawley Road was crude by comparison to later models. 1946, just before Christmas that last one was done, so I had a good Christmas. What came next for John Searle would be a lifetime spent on the study of this phenomenon, soon to be known as the Searle Effect. When I started this technology, there was absolutely nothing to turn to in book form or scientific formulas by which it could be designed. In fact, I had to rely on dreams, dreams as a child. These dreams, which were nightmares, now were going to be changed into a world reality. John Searle was learning to match pieces of knowledge with his dreams as he began his lifelong effort to explain the startling result each time he powered up his generator. Lack of education as a child was actually useful to me because I now had to look at things and question what I saw. In 1950, he enlisted in the Royal Air Force and was stationed at an airfield in Suffolk. By 1952, John Searle was back in civilian clothes. He boarded at the home of George Haynes, a terminal cancer patient in the West Midlands. It was a very highly religious uh, person. He was dying of cancer, and uh, he wouldn't, it, it, it said he wouldn't die in hospital, he'd want to go home. Every night I went up to his bed at 8 o'clock to listen to him telling me about the Bible and that, and then he'd ask me what my interest was, and I told him about this. He said, John, 
if you can make people look up in the sky, he said, because they're always walking with their heads down, I will pay the cost of doing it. So he called his son up and said, when, uh, on Wednesday, take John down to Wensbury to the government sales, uh, market sales of government equipment. Get everything he wants. Here came the first real opportunity to build his generator as a flying disc and observe the phenomenon. So we got the shed, cables and all the sort of bits and pieces one needs to do some experimenting. And eventually we made the first three-footer. We piled it up and, of course, it, it went. It sort of hovered there of, of some yards above the treetops. Radio sets all switches on in the area. And then it shot off and the, the radio sets went dead again. So I went up to the room and I said to him, I said, oh, sorry, we've lost it. Did the people look up? I should think so. Make another one. From his deathbed, George Haynes Sr. financed the earliest experiments on the flying disc generator. Searle tried to keep the three-foot disc from shooting off into space. I said to him, I cannot control it. Oh, don't worry, sir. Make the people look up. We did, all right. There was no ifs or buts about that point. It, though I tried different ideas each time to try to overcome this lifting effect, I never won. Six flying discs were built, and all six were lost. We had to do six before the man died. Each one, we were trying different ideas, and we couldn't solve the problem. We lost them. Uh, the, the last one, we had a 60-ton shear pin connected, but even that sheared and, and was lost. From then on, we had a break. The old man died. The other chap told me to get out of the house. I wasn't wanted there, so I moved on to other accommodation. So for a few, a couple of years, nothing happened. Then, where I was staying, a man wrote the electric board and said that this man is very clever in magnetics and, and electrics. Um, I would like you to interview him for a possible job. John Searle, at age 21, is made foreman, part of a three-man team in charge of 11 areas in research and development at Midlands Electricity Board. There was three of us in the team we were in charge of 11 areas. All technical problems which they couldn't solve at the workshops came to us to uh, carry out the research on. Research and development at Midlands Electricity Board. This was a perfect fit. Just like it was at British Rewinds, electrical engineers and experts in magnetism and electricity again surround him. He could tap their knowledge and begin to understand this phenomenon of the flying disc generator. John Searle made a critical decision to investigate what it was and not what he wanted it to be. Before we reach that point where we can say, right, we can now design you a generator, how much output you want, and we'll get down and design it for you. We had to check and find a lot of more little steps, a lot of little problems we had to try to identify. This thing wanted to fly. So to me then, the easiest thing was to work on a body. Let it fly. While I've been playing with this, with equipment, I've uncovered a lot of things which I suspected but couldn't prove. Whenever possible, John Searle engaged in dialogue with anyone willing to share their knowledge on things mechanical and especially things magnetic or electric. In March 1953, Searle married Doris Shirley Foster. They would have six children. Family life would be difficult. He was consumed by the phenomenon of the flying disc generator. Now, I was sort of at the headquarters of the Mid Electricity Board. I had 11 different subunits around to look after. Because I started talking in my spare time about this effort. And of course, everyone was laughing at me. One day, the boss heard all the news. He came into me and he said, John, you're here. As a member in charge, 11 areas. Men under you are laughing at you. Now, we have three options. A, pack your bags and go. B, shut up. C, do it. So, I thought on it a minute and I said, well, I like my job, 
so I don't want to go. B, I can't shut up. C, I'll do it. So I said, well, what do you want? I said, we want to press, argonarbon, magnetite. All right, we've got all that here. What else do you want? I said, the ingredients. Well, you tell us the ingredients, we'll get them. With this opportunity, John Searle's knowledge of electricity and magnetism grew to a point where he began to theorize the startling behavior of his generator. One such theory in magnetism met with stiff resistance and would help to form the genesis of mockery and ridicule that follows him to this day. My magnetism is not your magnetism. Could it be that general magnetism contains multiple bands, a magnetic spectrum, exactly the same as white light contains a spectrum of colors? Magnetism is identical to light. In a way, that's how I look at it. They are identical, they're pairs. John Searle used a combination of AC and DC current when magnetizing the components of his generator. If we isolate the particular band we want, and then print that. We have something different, we have a wave. This is the Searle effect, the intersection of two magnetic fields creating a magnetic wave that can be measured and amplified. John Searle designed a generator using magnetic fields to induce a flow of electrons from a rare earth element through a system of rotating magnetized components so that those electrons would be collected, compressed, used and recycled. Magnetic forces and electrons in motion, the two key issues necessary for the production of electricity. Here I am. They won't come and see that what I say is true. There is a condition where you can get a wave in a magnetic sense, like a wave, a sine wave, and they act as a river. Now that's stationary until reaction effects take place. And to do that, you have to set a cylinder on it, magnetize, and then that wave goes into motion. Now the roller place on that field, it floats. We know it cannot touch that, it's too dense with energy. So it will float. So we got something floating there, then if this wave is moved due to reaction between this plate, this roller and this plate, then that wave is going to carry that regardless. So the roller maintains still its constant height. Though it's now running many times faster, it does not fly off. The magnetic field is holding the roller tightly to the plate. At the same time, the electrons moving through the layered elements are collected and compressed on the surface of the plate, lifting the roller and creating space between the roller and the plate. So the roller flies round and doesn't roll round. As it moves, the field is being rewritten all the time. So the field never diminishes. It cannot diminish because a magnetic field is in constant running order. The energy, or electrons, moving through the system recycle. The rare earth element attracts new electrons that also move through the system and recycle. Because of their negative charge, the electrons compress, causing the drop in temperature and creating the energy field that radiates from the generator. In 1956, I was soldering. I, I had to produce another unit. And this time, we wasn't powering it up. I wanted to try to meter up things to see what the oscilloscope was showing me. And it was accidental that when I took the hot iron to solder the wire on, I couldn't solder it. Selling from the machine was cooling things faster than you could heat them. That was accounting for the, some of the behavior of those early models. Counted for why when I got a hold of it, I was stuck to it. John Searle created a generator design that became a superconductor, producing extreme cold and incredibly high voltage that caused it to lift off the ground. But could he control this flying disc generator? In the late summer of 1954, he left Midlands Electric Board and moved to Berkshire near Pangbourne. Walk up, we see the actual, the actual field. This field, it's a field where 
it's joined to the land, I could get onto it. The beauty of it, as you see, is quiet, nice and open. Here, I would do experiments. Experiments to discover how to control the flying disc generator. You see, we use gyro technology. Now, gyro, that's only one problem about the gyro, is that you can't put it at the rim of the craft, right on the rim, because you've got to control it by striking it from outside of it. You can't do good striking on the inside because it don't do nothing. It won't respond. But if you strike a gyro on the outside, it tips at that point, instant. The inside of the flying disc generator was equipped with switches and circuits to activate 64 hammers positioned around the rim. It was in this field we solved that problem. So which way would they fly? Down this way or over the trees and around. It depends whether it was night, evening or day. If it's daytime, we go to over the trees. When it starts getting dark like this, you could run up and down this. The chance of vehicles coming up there was very unlikely. John Searle's time here was short. By 1955, he moved his family to 17 Stevens Close, Mortimer, Berkshire. But now he could control the flying disc generator. And I haven't been here for a very long time. But uh, that was where my early days experiment was done. That's before we used Warminster area for, for the big work. We built 41, a total of 41 crafts that actually flew and were fully controllable. There were six before that that were lost. They could not be controlled. During the 1950s, John Searle continued to experiment with his flying disc generator, but it needed a name. One thing I didn't know was that, A, uh, gravity can be inversed. No scientists ever had come up with that idea, that clearly the magnetic field was completely different to the magnetic fields we knew of. The heavy rollers spinning as they rotate around the plates acted like a flywheel and caused a gyroscopic effect. The extremely high voltage created a dense field surrounding the generator, a device built with individually magnetized components. It was a device, and it contained all these signs within it. You've got the gyro, side control effect, a frequency control, magnetic, electrons, photons, Basically, nearly every size involves in one engine. Incorporating these principles displayed by the device, he christened it Gyro Flywheel High Energy Density Mechanical Magnetic Device, but it would soon be known as the Levity Disc. And the first successful one was launched in 1956. It went up, we flew it across the houses, because Crompton Hill, we up above the houses, it's a wonderful sight, you should go there, and we flew this over the rooftops, and then we had a surprise. You see, we saw the tiles waving as it went along, and the din that made it in the middle of the night was absolutely fantastic. And the reason is, of course, there's a suction underneath this. It's in a way the suction is. And it pulls these tiles up and down. Some fall to the ground, obviously. But what we also found is that when pigeons or birds flew near to it, or they were taken by surprise and they got caught, they fell to the ground. And of course, if they hit the ground, they break their necks. So you, you saw in the papers, birds died from a UFO and made it quite clear to them it was not a UFO. The government knows it's identified. They know what it is. Every government knows what it is. They've known it for years. I said, so we're dealing with something in reality. By 1956, the first team of investors agreed to fund John Searle and the research on his levity disc. This group of 13 pensioners assembled as a club called Launch Unit Navigable Individually Controllable, or Lunic Enterprises. And we toyed with this down in Warminster, where we built these, uh, what label was labelled UFOs. We called them levity discs. 
but we built this. Now, 13 old age men backed that project, and they only backed me on the following condition, that I did not go commercial with this. They didn't want any problems with tax man. They were doing this for fun. But to me, that was all right. That was giving me a chance to experiment, work out ideas, to prove two things. It could hold together, yeah. and it could fly. Okay. And this is what we proved. That it could hold together, and it could fly. The device as an electric generator for domestic use became an afterthought. John Searle knew this was the beginning of his lifelong battle with official persons and with the scientific community. Very soon, British civil aviation had questions about the levity disc. What happens if the power fails? How do you steer it? And the big question, how does it fly? You've got to put a load, resistance load, on the generator to speed it up. And once it starts, you get to about, uh, on average, about a million volts, it begins to really build up a charge. Then the superconductivity switches in and the earth pushes it up. But it's also affecting the atmosphere above it. It is making it pull to the rim and rotate with a field. So you've got a, like a hurricane effort. It's sucking it up. Over the years, we experimented with many ideas. The trouble was the authorities uh, said that we could not fly this device in public, on show, unless we made some means to control it in the event of power failure. We call this a flight cell. And what we've done is that all around the vehicle, we've chopped it into 64 sections in which we can open a section. The idea was that by opening one, you could direct the angle. Across the past, the smallest flying machine we could fly, which would be controllable by ham operators, was a 21 footer. The need for a craft that large was because anything smaller than that couldn't hold the vacuum tubes or, 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 or valves, as, as John put, uh, calls them, or the transformers or the radio equipment. There just wasn't enough room. Also, in order to direct this craft, it needs certain electronic solenoid equipment and some hydraulics. In those days, we had to use very large bottles, big heavy transformers, big chokes. They all take up and mass relays. Uh, and they were the GPO type. They were very large. Um, so we're looking at a massive weight. 64 flight cells at the rim of the levity disc could be opened or closed independently, changing the energy flow, which caused the disc to tilt and turn, to accelerate or stop, to gain or reduce altitude. Signals to the flight cells were sent using ham-operated radio. The command signal was always preceded by a coded radio signal to prevent outside interference. Ham operators, and I must admit that without their help, this could not be done. You have to have some signal coming from it to be able to trace it. If you have a series of ham radio operators that are willing to help you, and the professor did. John would call them and tell them when the unit should be, when the disc should be over their position, and then give them, have them, it also emitted a beacon so they could triangulate on it, and then make a course correction that he would tell them the code to use. So they would give a frequency code to the ship it would make a course correction, if needed, to go wherever he wanted. And uh, he had a whole series, whole network of hams all across the, uh, the world. I use 1,200 cycles for my transmitter carrier. That's why the, the tourists came after me when they saw the transmitter I was using on television. Yeah, it was military. We've got to confiscate that. That's illegal. You have no rights to that. So I said, well, if you take that away, how do I protect the public from this massive weight up there? This equipment gets me to carry a 1,200 cycles a second. I need that to carry my information to that craft so I could continue transmitting and carrying out this flying research work. Although he tried, it was hard to keep the levity disc secret. John Searle saw a future that would want to take advantage of his generator and levity disc. It's the flying side that brought the money in. Yeah. 
In 1968, we reached the greatest height we ever done. The generator could be used as a power source, but it was the flying side that caused excitement. These craft had designations and sequence numbers, such as the P-11. Probe means a probe. It's a man. Uh, P-M if, we, if it's a man vehicle. But this, these first ones we did were all our man. In his growing library, John Searle kept extensive records of his generator and levity disk. Among these documents are calculations and descriptions of experimental flight tests, some of which survive today. These are photos and excerpts from the original record of the P-11 launch on June 30th, 1968. We have carried the P-11 weighing 10 hundredweight to a position clear of the overhead high voltage lines. The sun is shining, but it is not pleasant. The wind is cold and a force of eight is blowing. We shall attempt a full launch and run at 1500 hours Greenwich Mean Time. We prepared the power supplies to all equipment on the craft. We are very busy, yet from the corner of my eye I can see watchers, but none have dared to enter the field. People rush to hide from us as if we were some kind of aliens from another world. Time to start the craft's generator up. This is connected to an outside source, in our case a small diesel engine. A minute passes by and the cutout switch of the craft breaks contact with the outside power source. A call comes through from Cornwall that all is ready. The carrier beam is on for the run. We accelerate the craft's generator. Now she is on her own. When the generator started, there was a whine rising to a high pitch, but that has stopped. The craft is shorting up very fast. Yes, the craft will clear the power lines with no trouble. I have stopped taking photos to record what I saw. The ground appeared to be rocking, yet I could not sense any such rocking. No noise was heard, but leaves and other material on the ground around us began to move in circles. I glance over the far side where two strangers were. What happened to them? They were running for cover in the direction from which they had come, most likely scared stiff. Then the call came in. She's crossing Cornwall now. Time, 1503 hours, Greenwich Mean Time. Our team in Cornwall turned the craft for its run back. The P-11 was over Cornwall three minutes after launch, a distance that would take four hours to travel by car. She climbed at rates of up to one mile per second, and during that day rose to heights of 15 miles above the surface of the Earth. We went over to the launch point and found that all the small undergrowth had been pulled up with the soil and had left a scooped out effect where the craft had stood. Another problem we must solve is this pulling up of Earth on liftoff and this burnt ring mark effect. We found that it does tend to mark the ground. The reason for this is that there's an iron content in the ground. It is this iron that's been pulled up, and it pulls that surface of ground up with it. It set up the rare earth on the outer layer, put it on the inner, reverse, and of course it solved it just in one action. Instead of having a, a, a magnetic field focusing to the ground, it made a donut shape around the vehicle. The field now is a very small sea field around the rim of that craft. Results is no focus to the ground, no ground distortion occurs. The other problem often presented in my case when scientists speak about my work is that it ionizes the air uh, around the craft. This is not true. There is no air around that craft. There's a magnetic field, there's a gap, a vacuum between that and the rim, and it's the photons which is discharged, trapped by the magnetic field, which gives it the glow. The P-11 was a great secret success story, a beginning to a new age which promised that one day in the future, man would travel by this method into space. Was it secret? It was supposed to be, but only the media was allowed to come and watch. First, we had 400 scientists that were also allowed to come who downed it. What they said was this, it could not support itself, let alone fly. So I said, right, we have now tested 40 different structure ideas. I'm going back to the one I originally proposed. You are invited and the media to come and watch, providing you do not disclose where the work is done. Sunday tidbits came and watched the flight test. Then we had the news of the world come, the fight, because they'd seen it. We want to see this disc. At St. John's Hall in Mortimer, Berkshire, England, scientists, the press, and the public were invited 
as he demonstrated his technology and declared his intention to build a manned craft. This was the hall in which we used to hold our first Sunday of each month shows. This is the hall that was known as St. John's Hall. That's the stage which I used to stand on to deliver my lecture. The audience would sit here, the press used to be at the back. When we had a load of press come to make mockery, we had the curtains brought, I stood there, we had the national anthem played there, so they all had to stand. Uh, all these people came to make mockery. At the end of 10 hours, the press came up to me and said, we have never seen a man stand there, talk for 10 hours without looking at any references whatsoever. So I replied to them, when you speak from the heart, you don't need papers. John Searle may have spoken from his heart, but by 1969, his message played to a world that had witnessed American astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin returning safely to Earth, having walked on the moon, the single greatest achievement in history. The media made the levity disc a sideshow, and John Searle the original urban spaceman, a crackpot, the flying saucer man. Few would take him seriously. The merits of his generator design as a power source were lost in his single-minded effort to prove his levity disc. The press and the publicity grew. There must be thousands of newspaper articles, television footage, and there were thousands of people who came and they filmed and they filmed, they took pictures. That was the type of publicity we had. And there are many books on the market written by many writers that include my work. We had BBC regularly each month for nearly two years would come and update the people. First they would take them back to what happened the last month. Then they would say, we went down to the woods today and this is the progress. The structure of the demo one is now together and the housing is going in that will house the power unit that will lift it into the skies at this point. The Demo-1 would prove that electromagnetic flying disks were not only real, but represented the future in power and transportation. In 1968, John Searle formed the NSRC for this task. The National Space Research Consortium headquartered in his home at Mortimer, Berkshire, England. Scientists and the media were invited to watch the Demo-1 being built outdoors on a piece of land loaned to him for this purpose. This is the voice of John Searle during the construction of Demo-1. The position today is that we now know so much about defining these vehicles from the point of a unmanned vehicle that we feel the time is right to go ahead and carry people. John Searle had plans for a larger craft that would carry three people. He continues. The, the three-seater craft which we've been asked to do, it will be a 90-foot diameter vehicle. It will weigh roughly uh, 90 tons on completion and um, the purpose is that one pilot will carry two official experts with him. Mm -hmm. One day you'll see a three-seater car with a lone star in the sky and within a year you'll see massive giants coming up into the sky, taking 2,000 people from New York to London in 20 minutes or 15 minutes from London to uh, Sydney in 30 minutes, and we won't think nothing about it. And I think that uh, this is business. This is really what industry wants. Fast movement, cheap price, no noise, and no pollution. And, uh, and the levity disc will give you this. While the press and publicity pushed John Searle to the scientific fringe, some individuals examined the merits of his generator design. Was this a revolutionary new way to generate electricity? Searle came to an important realization that will stay with him for the rest of his life. Once they see that, they want it, they want to own it. That's everywhere I go, the same thing happens. It's the same ignorance and greed coming together as a terrible, dangerous situation. 
John Searle came out into the open with his levity disc, expecting a different reaction to the one he got. The press and media were quick to mock and ridicule the flying saucer man. Reinventors, I think, will always hit problems. They will always, always be ridiculed, they'll be laughed, they'll be mocked at, um, all the big, you name them, they all came under the same bombardment. Searle saw himself as an inventor like so many others before him. He would endure the mockery because he knew his truth about the generator and levity disc. His confidence never wavered. Well, everybody who does something different is a crank. And if the, this is the good sign of a, an inventor, then I'm, I don't mind being called one. The interview that was interviewing me way back then, in 68, when he said, um, uh, are you a crank? And I said, well, everybody that invents things are cranks by you people. So I don't mind being one. That must mean I'm going to be important one day. Did he invent something so astounding it had to be marginalized? His generator and levity disc could no longer be kept secret. Searle tried to patent his new generator design, the power source for his levity disc. Back there in 68, the um, patent office rang me to say that, having studied your patent you submitted, we advise you not to patent it. It's a know-how. Never, never patent a know-how. When you're ready to go to the market, you have two options. You can either take out a watermark in your name or in the name of the company who's going to produce it. You've got two options. Never, never tell anyone all the details. The vital bit that makes it work, keep it to yourself until you're on the marketplace. Having been advised that his generator design is a know-how and he should keep it to himself until ready for the marketplace only served to further isolate Searle. During this period, he held a full-time job and spent all of his spare time developing the generator and levity disc. Several events helped to explain his conviction. The first happened near Warminster, England, where John flew his P-11 craft on Sundays. When I first came in the open, I was caught red-handed <laughs> flying the craft. Every Sunday night, we would pull the craft in, take the plates out, put new, and send it off again. Off we go to the next weekend. Now, this one night, now we'd done this so often, we never, never dreamt of anyone coming by. Not at that time of the night. And there we are, we sent the craft off, and unknown to us, we were actually seen by a television crew on the way back from something they did that night. So Monday they went to the Warminster area to see the uh, two RAF people in charge of the UFO investigation that went and studied UFO claims. And they said, they saw this craft. They said, no, we got no new craft on test because they thought it was a new Air Force project being secretly tested. No, they said, so they go down to the radar unit of theirs and ask uh, to check last night's reports. Nothing there. They said, we saw it. Let's go down there next Sunday and see if anything happens. And of course, the Air Commodore agreed to go with them. We brought the craft down. We changed everything. They didn't interfere. They were watching, but unknown to us. I put the new plates in and sent it off. I said to Tony, let's pack up. Get out of here. I, I feel something strange. Let's get out. And then, bang on my shoulder, Tony, stop fooling about me. God, this is the Air Commodore, Great Britain. It, this is his name. Oh. Ah. And the ITV camera crews turn on the cameras. Searle was at home in Mortimer the following Thursday with his friend, Reverend George Nicholson, and a visitor from Aldermaston Atomic Works. At 3.15, I had Reverend George Nicholson with me yeah. as witness, I said. Newsflash. Newsflash, it said. The Air Commodore has a message to tell you. Then I knew. The voice said, this is the Air Commodore of Great Britain, and I knew instant what they were going to say. And he said, 
People in Warminster may now be able to sleep in peace. For weeks, people in the Warminster area had been reporting numerous UFO sightings. The British Air Commodore broadcast a news flash assuring that it was John Searle's flying discs and not UFOs. There are no aliens. It is the work of John Searle. We caught up with him last Sunday night and asking him when that was going to return, he said next Sunday. We didn't believe him. We called him a liar. But he insisted we could stay if we wish, but it wouldn't come back till next Sunday. And we did. I'd like to inform you we are now packing our bags and moving on because we agree John saw means what he says. And then he said the words, when this man comes out in the open and show the world, he will overrule the Americans and the Russians. He will be master of all air and space. And the flash ended. After the news flash, the scientist from Aldermaston Atomic Works insisted Searle turn over his levity disc. The scientist, not like that, give it to me. I said, no. So he pokes me again and said, give it to me. I said, no. So he turns to Reverend George Nixon, pokes him and said, make him give it to me. He said, I can't make him give it to you. What are you offering him? Nothing. It's about to keep a lot of people employed and he will get royalties from the work done. So Reverend George Nixon said to him, it's not royalties he wants, he wants cash now. He said, all right, so you're not giving it to me. I'll stop everyone helping you. Then you'll give it to me. And he went off. A month later, checks started to come in from Australia, Japan, because the news had flashed all over the world about this Air Commodore uh, catching me. With this attention, Searle was further convinced that the outside world would eagerly accept his generator and levity disc. The activity around the building of Demo-1 drew the attention of Dr. Arthur Kane from NASA in the United States. Here's a view. Dr. Kane from NASA there. He wrote a serious report to NASA. He came and interviewed me and checked everything. And he stated in his reply that unless NASA married this technology, when they hit the marketplace, they'd be completely finished. They would have nothing to match it or to touch it. By June of 1976, this letter arrived. It reads in paraphrase, Dear Mr. Searle, I have the responsibility for U.S. Air Force propulsion and energy conversion research and development. We would like to acquire a copy of your report entitled Disc-Shaped Type of Flying Craft. The letter is signed, George Ulig, Major, United States Air Force, Engineering Division. Edward Air Force Base examined my work. I was requested to submit my work to them to evaluate so that I could get funding. He said he'd be in London and he'd like to collect all the materials to take back for the scientists to examine. All I had to do was be in London to deliver the goods to him. That was only a small unit, a four-footer, which we just took around to show what it's, it's made up and how we make them up, how it functions, in which you're not letting it fly. You're just showing people how it, the thing works, so the unit runs very slow. As the Major's letter said uh, back <clears> to me, that they could find no inertia, and that goes against all grains. There were people who developed rockets for war, and were still making ballistic missiles for the purpose of future wars. So you got people geared to rocketry. Though they did look at this technology, they decided that it would take a lot of study work to understand it, and therefore, forget it, rocketry was vital. I was in the wrong place at the wrong time mm. regarding NASA and at the Edward Air Force Base mm. people. Whether John Searle was thought of as a serious inventor or just the flying saucer man, he had gained worldwide notoriety. The weekend work on his levity disc was updated regularly and featured by some media outlets. In one case, a demand was made for time that he didn't have. Searle explains. You were invited last Sunday to come and see it. Everybody was invited, all the media was. You didn't want to know. John Searle was nothing. This was all dreams. Now you suddenly see in a paper who did take the trouble to come, that is true. All right, so you're not going to show me the IGV? No. Certainly, all right, we'll put pay to that. 
Send the command, front page, John Searle, come man. Do not invest in it. Thinking that that would force me to sell. What I did, I said that to the government. I told them, you know what I'm doing. This is slanderous defamation of character. And, that. and they wrote back, dear Mr. Sir, uh, we can't do nothing. But what we will do is we'll ask all our laboratories to pay with all the information you need to help you. The British government was aware of John Searle if only as a result of his own letters complaining of the press coverage. This was a one-of-a-kind story. The flight performance claims for his levity disc were astonishing. It's just easy for us to put a craft up and send it to anywhere in the world, a man or man, and it will reach the point in the shortest possible time. The program on the models used to do from England to Australia in 30 minutes with no trouble at all. And we anticipate the Minecraft we're building now will also easily cope with that speed. From 1963 until about 1978, where we had to stop because of cost of operation, we flew, um, say for instance, the Demo 1. That flew 500 times around this globe through the use of ham operators. 500 times around the Earth, had the unmanned levity disc reached outer space? In his plans for the manned craft, Searle openly spoke to the press about a trip to the moon. The moon, as I say, we could say an hour trip. You land it after you clear the air belt. So you're 20 minutes climbing out. And what did the newspaper say? John Searle said, two seconds to the moon. John Searle didn't say that. John Searle said, 20 minute gentle climb out. Two seconds switch off par on the top plate to let it pick up speed, then put it back to hold it at that new setting. 32 minutes we should be in orbit around the moon to look for an ideal spot, probably 10 minutes to find an ideal spot to put down on. From the Earth to the moon in one hour? The flight tests of his levity disc established stunning claims that did not go unnoticed by the Cold War superpowers. They accused each other after detecting unknown spacecraft. There was a time where we did put a test. We did take a vehicle up there and Russia and were accusing the Americans of having a secret device up there. The Americans were accusing the Russians of it. It was neither. And that was the Air Commodore statement, really. Here the Americans and the Russians are thumping away at each other, accusing each other of these secret things going on. And here's a man in England twirling the knobs that is causing wholesale chaos with the big boys. Searle caused even more trouble. The high energy from his disc interfered with radio communication at nearby Black Bush Airport. Ironically, this was where he would earn his fixed-wing pilot's license to avoid any civil aviation objection to him piloting the first manned levity disc. I think it was the Daily Mirror report, a Derby area, about UFO night watch, where thousands were watching the sky for a UFO. Just a sort of ride away, John Searle and a colleague are testing one of their UFOs. The press rang me and said that Blackbush Airport said that they have phoned you up and asked you to remove your disc from the airfield area because you're blacking out the radio. Uh, is that right? I said, yes, they have asked me to remove it. This has now been done. They said, we'll be putting this in the paper, uh, this report. So I went and got the papers. Okay. UFO over Blackbush. A UFO appeared over Blackbush blacked out the radio communications of incoming aircraft. That's all it said. Now from that moment on, every article that came out said UFO, never ever made my, mentioned my name, but I had invited them to come and see the, the show. The press treatment of Searle began to take its toll. With the high level of attention, some of the Demo 1 team members became suspicious. Was there something genuine beneath the ever-growing circus around John Searle? Dispute and dissension came to the Demo 1 team. Dispute, uh, 
occurred and the team wouldn't turn up because unknown to me at the time, the one chap in charge of the work with me uh, had another team down in Eastleigh. He was making the same vehicle, but he would join my team to find out how we did it. They had a craft in exactly the same construction as mine. So we dropped them. We, we, I just dismissed the whole group and just finished it myself. John Searle would not patent his generator, so whatever was secret would remain secret. The money stopped coming in and he terminated the Demo One project in 1978. Soon he was faced with something new. I had a good team agreed at Mortimer, very good team. But then you see, like all teams, you'll get one who suddenly realized the value of what they're doing. And then greed comes into play. They think that by owning it, they control the will. They dictate who can do what and who can't, how much you've got to pay for that right. Um, and that's the, the shame of it, because here was something that should have been on the market. Generators had been on the market in 68. At home in Mortimer, Searle was served with court papers stating that he owed the electric board over 10,000 pounds. By 1982, he was arrested and accused of stealing electric power. Here's how he answered the charges. Well, what happened was electricity was expensive and I didn't have the wage packet to meet the cost of that working on this, trying to get this idea right. And we did have two units. One I took to shows, uh, and the one I fitted in the house and put all the wiring on it. The one in my house for 30 years, they took apart. They found no wear or tear. In fact, they were almost sure they only just been made. They was that good. What happened to that one? Well, they, when the court asked if uh, they could bring the generator in for the court to see it, uh, they said they had confiscated it. So. I, should, I feel inclined to think that they broke it open not knowing what was inside. Who confiscated it? The electric board it's themselves. Um, because they told the court that it did not comply, comply with their standards. The judge wasn't quite satisfied that I was this dangerous man that they were trying to portray. So they asked the chief man what was strange about this man's house? So he said, why? There was two little switches, block switches, what are called grid switches on a wall. So he pointed over to it and he said, see those two switches? Yes, what's strange about that? Well, he's got 16. We took the floorboards up, they've got power transformers on them. What's strange about that? Yeah, never seen anything like that before. So he asked him, what else was strange? So he said, well, out in the shed, he's got all this equipment from the floor to the ceiling. It looks like nothing. He said, what else was strange? Well, he said, we were trying to find where the electric came from. We cut the wall, we had to cut the walls open. We come on this box. He said, we took it out. When we open it, we got these plate things and we got rollers running round. So the judge said, what's strange about that? He said, well, we can't understand how they run. No, trust me. Can't you do that? No. Can't anyone do that? No. Is that man there cleverer than you? Yes. Here's your bill back. No way am I going to make that man pay you £10,975. I knew what the judge was trying to point out to him. That I can't be insane if I'm cleverer than him. The electricity to run his home sometimes came from his own generator. That generator was never returned to him. The semi-favorable court decision was costly. The price he would pay was divorce and the breakup of his family. The memory is difficult. I'm a loyal person, and I can... that, that I wouldn't walk out unless pushed out. Only the work kept me going. John Searle sacrificed his family in favor of his invention. He left his home and disappeared into the Midlands of England. The only consolation came in the form of recognition for his commitment to his generator. 
Professor Shinichi Siki from Japan suggested the name that would stay with the generator to this day. You are the finder of the technology, so it ought to have your name to confirm you are the inventor. So they suggested it be called the Soul Effect Generator. Soul Effect Generator is simple, just call it SEG. When I look at it now, it's a shame that the amount of stuff that was lost, because uh, there was uh, about 101 volumes of records of everyday work photographs that were taken by people that sent me copy, press articles. Um, these, these have all vanished over time. After the court case in 1982, John Searle walked into obscurity in the Midlands of England, taking nothing with him but the secret know-how he had refused to patent. His extensive research library, records, documents, all equipment, and his family were left behind. Very little has been recovered. He had this, he had that. He showed no evidence. He said things were destroyed by fire. We've heard that story many times before by people. A load of crap. I don't believe a word the man says. Uh, that is the standard thing. Four years later, in 1986, Searle was found and asked to return to his lifelong work. He had lost nearly everything, but here was the chance to tell his story and prove his generator with a more scientific approach. He was a man that hunted for two years to find me. And when he did find me, by luck, uh, that he contacted somebody in America. Oh, yes, we just spoke to him. He's in the Midlands. Um, so they gave him my address and he came up uh, and he said, if I come back, I'll, I'll, I'll put 2,000 in, 2,000 pounds in to get you started. For the next 15 years, John Searle lectured all over the world. England, Australia, Scotland, Canada, and the United States, to name only a few. Crowds were sometimes shocked to discover he was still alive, but eager to hear him tell the story of his generator and flying disc. In Germany, 1989, he was awarded the honorary title Professor of Mathematical Structures of Creation and Energy. I was well known. I was known by people like Sir Freddie Laker and other people like that. I met princesses. Uh, we talked. They enjoyed every minute with me. John Searle had become Professor Searle, and an aura of mystery had formed around the flying saucer man. But where are the witnesses? There are plenty of witnesses around, but there seems to be a problem. They do not like to come out in the open. They have read too many books about men in black breaking in, destroying their homes, burning their property, and FBI and things like this, breaking in, stealing this, stealing that. And they're frightened. They're, they're frightened. Is the Searle Effect Generator so profound a device that it would change everything we know? Perhaps Searle's refusal to patent his secret was working against him. This is Richard Veer Compton. I worked with John. I was responsible for converting um, ordinary 250 volt um, electric drills um, so that they would run on 12 volts so we, could so we could cut up the timber rather than using hand saws and we could uh, speed the process of building the disc, the 30-foot disc. Ken Pirelli turned up at my doorstep and told me about Searle. I went to see him and saw what he was doing, was rather amazed that he was building a disc in somebody's garden. Um, so I thought, well, this could be fun, let's see what happens. Uh, and of course, very soon, one began to feel that nothing was really going to happen. If nothing would happen, what was it that captured Veer Compton's interest? Well, basically, the soul effect was meant to t turn the ether, which is all around us, which contains energy, and tap into this energy, which has euphemistically now been known as zero-point energy. And various other people who followed Searle's footsteps have also potted around, and they've tapped into it by mistake. At his home in Mortimer, Searle had been arrested for stealing electric power. Veer Compton had visited Searle years before the arrest and remembers the switching over to the Searle effect generator. He said what he was going to do was to switch the Searle effect generator on by cutting off the electric power and um, it would then be running on the Searle effect generator. Well, as I said before, and I keep using this word, the jury is still out as to what John actually did. Were the puffs of smoke and mirrors? 
did he switch a straightforward inverter to inverter on? Was there any dip in the voltage? As far as we were concerned, one minute uh, the lights were on, and the next minute the lights were still on. And there was no dipping, there was no fading, there was no bleep. So the, um, this, this is unusual if you're switching from one power source to a next. But no, I have not seen the cell effect work. Veer Compton never saw it work. Why then have so many tried to copy the Searle technology? The story is always the same. John is told the really big money is not coming unless he can prove the generator by revealing how it is made. John Searle refuses to give up his secret. The secret will never be there until the conditions have been met as the patent office advised me will be fulfilled. And the sooner they understand that, and get down and get it done, the sooner we're going to do it. Where is the secret, John? Right here. Over the years, the standoff has continued. Searle has been involved with numerous individuals and companies making the same promises to rebuild his generator. They all fail for this same reason. They are working with scientists around the clock to get that engine out I showed you before I signed a contract with someone else to make it. But the controversy around Searle and his generator continues to grow. Some take a different approach. This is Michael Nelson from NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in the United States. A lot of people have an interest in anything that has to do with more efficient electric motors, more efficient energy devices, because we're in a situation where we're in an energy crunch. I do work for NASA. I can't say I'm representing NASA at this point. <laughs> But we just have an interest in, in this kind of, in what you're doing and what's going to come out of it, hopefully. What people want to say is impossible is that you keep a couple of magnets continuously moving. Uh, you know, you have one big stationary magnet and you have a smaller magnet that, that rotates around that. And if you can just show that, you've made a major step forward as far as showing, hey, this principle will sustain movement. That's the big question that I'm, I'm seeing people raising about what is possible or impossible. You have done this in the past, and so you're trying to get to a point where you can do this. You know, you're looking at just trying to do a small demonstration of, say, one roller, or how are you thinking about doing it? Well, at the moment, I'm hoping that uh, down there, California, uh, Morris will make what I call the, the glass demonstrator. Uh, and get that running and have a bulb uh, so that as uh, it revolves the bulb lights ah. and it just keeps on running all day long while you're lecturing. There you go. Once you do that, you've stepped beyond the bounds of what people say is possible. There are legitimate experiments that are going on to manipulate gravity involving um, superconducting disks that were uh, a, an intense magnetic field or an intense electromagnetic field is applied while a disk is spinning at a high rate of speed and we're there's there are experiments that are being conducted to to investigate this phenomenon superconductors and rotating magnets may hold the key to generating an unlimited source of energy but did John Searle's combination of rare earth materials and magnetic fields in his Searle effect generator already do that? Magnets have been used in a thousand different ways over the years, and this type of behavior has, has never been exhibited, has never been seen. This information was never given out before. Others who have gotten a hold of a piece of a, a demonstrator that would show the Searle effect, and they broke it apart, and they looked and studied, and it cannot be back-engineered. The SEG experiments, the initial ones that uh, Professor Searle talks about, occurred at the height of the Cold War. If this technology was viable, and he says that military people looked at it, if the technology really is viable, um, it would have been irresistible to the military. Whose hands the technology go into is the problem. That's why all these years I sort of geared this technology away from the military establishment. The claim is that these things have been built previously, they've worked, they've been demonstrated, but today no working prototype exists, and in order to build a working prototype, some people want a half a million dollars. 
and they can't show you anything until that time. As far as why hasn't anybody done it, many people have tried. The only one that has succeeded is Professor Cyril. We want to succeed again. We want to build again and demonstrate again. This is our primary goal. The only thing holding us back is funds. There's talk of power companies and utilities, big corporations, who are threatened by this kind of a concept. And the, the theory is that they've tried to suppress it. They've tried to suppress the research and prevent it from reaching market because it'll damage their markets. They want to maintain control. The oil uh, companies and uh, some of the other big businesses run this world. Unfortunately, they run most of our governments. So that even our government, which we would think would be very interested in something like this, uh, sometimes doesn't respond because of pressures put on by big business, by economic advisors. The most benefit to any individual, let alone a company, to be made from this is by appropriating it and distributing it to the public and by manufacturing it and making people pay to buy it from you. Taking out a patent, uh, copyrights, whatever you need to make yourself or your company the source for something so profound uh, the, 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 you would just, you would be the richest man in the world very quickly. Now if we give them a method where they can produce electricity at the cheapest method with virtually no input, I think that they would like that and go along with it and want to develop it themselves. Once they see that this device is going to be a fact of life, they will try to cash in on it. Maybe there are people somewhere uh, researching this type of thing, but it's pretty obvious that nothing uh, no, no hard evidence really has turned up yet. The effect was well known in the scientific community. It was compared to, it was alluded to. This is much like the serial effect, or this is a lot like the serial effect. So he was used as a, as a base point, and not somebody that was off the wall. If you can prove the technology, if you can demonstrate the technology is functional, that it really works, all the questions will be answered. People can't argue with success. They can't argue with what they see right in front of their own face. I can understand why uh, uh, people would have difficulty in understanding it because it does take a great deal of effort uh, uh, to make sense of it technically. Fernando Morris, an electrical engineer and computer specialist, is responsible for the most credible attempt to rebuild the Searle effect generator. We have something here that needs to be investigated, and really that's my role. I am a technical investigator of ESCG. In his home laboratory workshop near San Diego, California, Morris is following the footsteps of John Searle. Personally guided by Searle himself, he is rebuilding the generator precisely as Searle did long ago. Morris developed the unit that reveals a magnetic sine wave in the Searle generator. That's how I started off, is to try to build a magnetizer for it. And if I could de develop this sine wave, which I'd never heard of before, I think we're on to something and we can build upon that. Now that has been, that is proven, repeatable, and I've got the unit to do that. It's a process of magnetizing uh, the rollers and the plate. And when you develop sine waves on it, what you're in effect, you're developing a motor. And that's essential if it's going to be a viable device. That is exactly what I've been saying since 1946. There is a waveform in a magnetic domain on that metal. And the scientists say, impossible. Morris has invested his time and considerable personal fortune into this effort. After years of studying Searle's books, trying to decipher their meaning, and endless question and answer sessions with the man himself, what does he know that assures him Searle is right? I'm going to release a piece of information here that I've shared before, and that is the law of squares. That's one of those question marks right now, is how does that come about? It took me a while to understand it, but what it is, it represents time, space, and energy. And what it says, it's in a random state. That's not useful energy, but what John has done, he's, he has transposed that matrix so that the output is uniform and uh, within nature uniformity means resonance so if you can resonate that random energy you got yourself 
an electric current because electrons are the only things that are free to move on metal. So what we got here is a converter of random energy into electrical current. And that's the brilliance behind the machine here is not only was John able to uh, decipher his matrix, but he was able to make it into a workable device. And that's the SEG. Morris's mock-up of the SEG needs an outside power source, just like Searle's original back in 1946. This unit does not contain the rare earth material and will not display the Searle effect. It was built to demonstrate Searle's contention that spinning magnets give off an electric charge as measured by the flashing LEDs. What will be the reaction if and when the Searle generator functions as the inventor assures it will? I think the public will demand to know why has this technology been ignored? Why have the experts failed to recognize it? John has a solution that is really the ultimate solution because it's, we're using energy that's already available in nature and it's benign. Uh, I think we have a wonderful opportunity here and uh, it's a shame it hasn't, it hasn't been uh, taken advantage of. I mean, John has been struggling to get this technology out for years. John A. Thomas Jr. wrote a book about Searle, then formed a corporation with him in 1996, DISC, Direct International Science Consortium, for the purpose of rebuilding the Searle generator. Thomas's study of the Searle effect has convinced him beyond any doubt that Searle is telling the truth. The funding that was done for all of this work originally was done by individuals that wanted to see this done, all private, no public uh, money was put in. People in, in this country and in, in, in London, in England, all around the world have been lied to. They have been told that this does not, can't exist or doesn't work. Every Sunday, Professor Sher would go out and physically demonstrate a craft going up into the air in front of a whole crowd and, and was, there was no admission. Here is the craft, here it is in the air, this is what it does, and they didn't believe it and they shunned him and called him in and classified him in with UFO people and, and, and fringe people and he's showing you. My God, there it is. And the United States has not heard of Professor Cyril. They don't know who in the hell he is. The people of this world have been offered this technology in a refined form that usable since the early 50s and it was their right to have it and it's been taken away from them by the media and by the power companies and by the people who are running this economic society. And we have been told that we cannot have this and it can't exist, yet we could be living in a new world today that we should have had 25 years ago. John Searle has since reformed the Searle International Space Research Consortium, or SISRC, an offshoot of his earlier organization. He lives and works in a small residence in the north of London. It is packed with equipment and computers. Visitors come from all over the world and are mostly welcomed by the man with a wary eye. All my life since that lesson, I see this everywhere. People are more impressed with lies than the truth. I can't because I'm talking from the heart, the truth of what I know and what I do. But the proof that everyone wants to see is the generator running. It's not enough that Searle has written thousands of pages in his books, volume after volume, demonstrating his knowledge of magnetism and the tremendous scope of his work. It is a standard problem. Here is something that is not confirmed in print, technical book. It has to be confirmed in print. You market it, you'll get four Nobel Prizes at least. The Searle effect generator represents a fork in the road of scientific development that was abandoned nearly a century ago when ether theory became a relic of the past. John Searle came along, and whether he knew something special or just didn't know any better, he chose the empty road and traveled it alone. Could it be that Searle is right? They look at John Searle as a, a, a silly old fool, lost his marbles. They ought to be in a nursing home, being cared for. If they don't make it, they don't want to know. If it don't come inside their rooms, they don't want to know. The trouble is, 
we are confronted by a brick wall called the expert scientific world. If they haven't done it or cannot do it, it's impossible to do. All these years, 1964, we were at a peak, we were demonstrating, and still the scientists say it's impossible to do. Really? Well, we're going to show you. They're wrong. And they have held up this technology since 1946 to today. Perhaps it's easier to believe that Searle's technology does not exist. The Searle effect generator at first look seems to violate known physical laws. Energy must come from somewhere. John says he found it in the rare earth material. Could it be that simple? Searle speaks his own language, a combination of known physics and terms he created to describe his invention. Could it be that John Searle is misunderstood? Numbers in squares told Searle that nature has a way of creating order out of chaos. Does the Searle effect generator convert random energy into usable electricity? When his generator is overloaded, it affects gravity and flies. John says he gave it a body and let it fly. What is the truth? German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer was once quoted as saying, all truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. Could it be that John Searle's technology is passing through Schopenhauer's three phases of truth? The movement toward alternative energy sources is worldwide and essential. The promise of a working Searle effect generator represents a paradigm shift and a renewed hope for all life on Earth. The questions around John Searle and his invention need only one answer. Build a working generator. When the rollers are moving around the plates and the energy is there to use, or when the skies are filled with flying disks transporting goods and people from place to place. Until that time, we have the man who speaks from his heart. Seems strange after all these years to be walking on this lump of ground. And this is what they call the common, but to do sort of shows, you had to get permission. They never refused me, I was never refused. They gave me the okay. So we used to do our lift off and take off over there. And the audience would be here. So we would fly over here, make up we were crushing, and it wasn't by the hell of breath, <laughs> then up it would go again. This area uh, was a good place for shows. People come from far away. I mean, everything was done. The people said never happened. <laughs> They're dreaming. Here's the very film.